Okay, uh, commissioners, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, Villages Budget Workshop will come to order. This is uh, an informal workshop with Robert's rules uh, suspended. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Mesa? Here. Commissioner Zero? Commissioner Melanie Goldman? Here. Commissioner Rose? Here. Mayor Hoskins? Here. Okay, so this is part two of our uh, brainstorming workshop. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Village Administrator Rachel. Uh, I have a public comment. Oh, yeah, we have to call public comment. Joseph Sullivan. Hi, um, I'm Jeff Sullivan. I own Daver Duffy's Tavern. Um, I wasn't here at the last meeting, but at the last meeting, Increasing business license fees was suggested as a way to generate additional revenue. Uh, business license fees have not increased since 2007 are, and are, quote, $25 for a home business and $100 for something like an electrical contract, <coughs> according, to the, according to the Forest Park Review. Um, for the record, Duffy's Tavern pays $3,050 in business license fees. Um, and that goes straight to you guys. Um, I'll also say that... Uh, in 2023, I paid $30,861 in, in, uh, to the Illinois Department of Revenue, of which you guys also get a chunk. Um, I hope you can continue to have this discussion about business licenses. I have not been able to anywhere on, on the Code website or the Forest Park website to get any information about what businesses pay for their business licenses. I know it's not $3,050 like I pay. Um, I hope you can continue that conversation and also in the future share that information with me and other people. Um, I'd also just like to share an observation. Last night I walked this street, well, I walked Madison Street from Des Plaines down to Harlem, both sides. Um, I counted 108 real estate parcels. 12 are vacant, and about a, approximately 31 of them do not, to the best of my knowledge, generate sales tax revenue. They are uh, gyms, beauty salons, healthcare providers, and other professional services like accountants that do not generate that tax revenue. That's 29% of the businesses on Madison Street have no potential to contribute sales tax revenue. And I find that very concerning and um, not a good sign for the village. Anyone else? Not that I know of. Any other public comment? Uh, could I just make one? Sure. I'm sorry, I forgot to put in this. That's right. Um, last meeting, uh, there was, uh, it might have been, been you, uh, Cliff Moritz, that said there was money being saved by uh, people that were having their water bill payments directly withdrawn from their checking accounts, which I do. And uh, you said there was a, sa I think you said there was a savings just in labor and postage alone. Okay. I do have a question. It was the email. It was the email spells. It wasn't the direct deposit, like direct withdrawal. So oh, this is public okay. comment, not question. Oh, okay. So okay. Well, okay. Um, right. My question was, I do get a paper copy that, that says I paid after the fact. Is there a way that people could opt out of that and save the 60 cents? Uh, I'm perfectly happy printing my own uh, if it would uh, be some sort of a solution. I know it's a nickel and dime solution, but... If that's something that could be done, I'm in. So I want to that's okay, no, just fine. for a follow-up with Clerk Moritz. Okay. Oh. All right. Great. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, okay. Uh, welcome to Budget Workshop Number Two. To everyone in the audience, uh, thank you for coming. We've never had this many people in the audience for a budget workshop, so I uh, appreciate you coming tonight. A little recap on what we did on April 8th. So uh, staff and commissioners spent some time talking about two different things. We talked about expenses, things that our departments uh, were going to need in the foreseeable future, and then also revenue ideas. Uh, Commissioner Vogue and Commissioner Mellon Rogovin were not able to be here that night, so I do want to give them a few minutes to uh, add anything to our expenses and our revenue. Feel free as we move about this, too, to add anything that comes up. Um, each of you has in front of you a list that includes all of the stickies and the expenses categories, and then another list that has the revenue ideas, so you don't have to squint when we talk about them coming up here shortly. One of the things I want to do tonight is talk about the 
cost involved with some of our expenses, and then what priority do we want to put them in? Um, you know, it's easy for all of us to say that our departments need this or need that, uh, but I think as staff and as a village council, we need to talk about what do we want to start working on right away. And when I say right away, I don't necessarily mean that everything will be in fiscal year 25, but um, what I'd like to start doing with fiscal year 25 is to start taking a short-term and long-term look at what we need. So while we're planning for this coming fiscal year, knowing what we're going to need in the following year, um, if there are multiple vehicles, for example, that are needed, how are we going to budget for those this year, next year, the year after? Um, we've got a couple things I know with the fire department that the lead time is three years. So. You know, what is entailed in placing an order, for example, for a fire truck? Um, you know, when do those funds need to, to come into play? Um, and then for once we do expenses, we'll talk more about revenue ideas and again, getting from staff and uh, commissioners and the mayor, you know, what are the priorities for those? So then when we go into the next budget meeting where we start talking about the actual dollar amounts and the things that we need for the coming fiscal year, we have a sense of what it is that's going to be coming up in the next couple of years as well. So um, for those of you in the audience, just real quick, like I said, um, we had staff and commissioners last meeting talk about some of the things that they are going to be needing. We talked about big expenses, so not necessarily related to you know our everyday operations. Um, of each of our departments, but things that don't necessarily come up year to year. Uh, and then we also talked about revenue ideas that, and again, they were just all ideas. This is kind of more of the format here where we can talk about do we want to, as a village, move forward with those. So um, we'll just start off with the expenses here. Uh, I do have some pricing from some people, department heads, if you kind of have an idea of what something's going to cost while we're going through this let me know because then I want to be able to prioritize it. Um, is something a high expense and a high priority or is it a, high, a low expense and a high priority? A low priority with a high expense, a low expense with a low priority. Um, I'm hoping that this will allow us all together to be able to take a look at the future in the next several years and be able to kind of come up with a checklist as to you know when we need to start working on things. Uh, things are going to also get added. You know, next year when we sit down and we do this process again, there's going to be things that we come up with. We may change priorities. Something that was low priority this year may next year become a high priority. But I want this to kind of be a guide for us as we move forward um, in the coming months. So Jackson Boulevard Pump Station is the number one thing on here. It's coupled with, you'll see water reservoir down here. So we know we've been talking about that for a while. So I'm going to take water reservoir. We know it's a high expense, and we also know it's a high priority because we've all seen the photos of our water reservoir, and we know that that's something that we have to start working on. Um, our village council has already started working on trying to find funding for that. Uh, these three were down in Springfield last week, and that was one of the asks that they went down to talk to legislators about. We've also got a request to Congressman Davis's office for a water resources development act. So this one was a pretty easy one. And then we're going to go ahead and put the Jackson Boulevard pump station with that because those go together. Any questions? Any comments? Okay. Um, exhaust fan for staff bathrooms. I think Vanessa, you had that at or staff. <laughs> uh, staff was able to price that out about two thousand dollars. So we know that that's a lower expense. That's what Sal sent me. I mean, he guess, I don't know if he guesstimated or got it. I don't know how many bathrooms he's doing either. I mean. <laughs> so can I, can I go in? Absolutely. Yes. While you're talking. Okay. You know what? Actually, let's take a pause because I like okay. to read them so that we all know what's going on. Okay. I'm going up there. So these are uh, street okay. safety improvements. Okay. You know, planning and implementation. Okay. So we've got walk, bike, drive, street safety improvement implementation, and and then yeah. improvement planning. So yeah. these kind of go together. Yeah. Okay. I'll go. This is an expense that could lead to the revenue idea. finding revenue. Okay. But I'd like to see like an accountability assessment. Of sort of by department, what we're spending money on okay. internally and through like uh, outsourcing those things. Okay. I think there's redundancies or where we could save money. 
Okay. And then another expense, which could lead to our health plan planning, is the comp plan, yes. strategic plan. So we've got comp plan up here, so I'll stick that yeah. one with that. I know, it's like, oh, this one's there. Yeah. And then uh, accounting assessment, and then street planning. And I have three revenue ideas. Okay. Can we hang on to that actually? Yes. Yeah. Well, I'll put them there and decide what it is. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. All right, so. I know new carpet easy, I know you had mentioned at one point, it's been 15, how long has it been since the clerk's office? At least it's yeah. about 15, maybe 17, I don't know exactly. This room, but like in the building department, their carpeting is terrible. It's probably the original. The police department, they get so much 24-7 um, traffic in there. It's the carpeted areas should should have yeah. that taken. <coughs> and can we put like, I don't know, an asterisk with like we know all our buildings have a ton of problems. Like we need to have the overall building. A, a, a discussion with our building assessment and that overall conversation about um, like that just needs to happen for our buildings. So yes. I don't know. So I'm going to put this in kind of like right here because I think that assessment needs to happen sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we could almost do that, this Same thing, thing yeah. within this. Thanks. Steve, what's your best guess on like a cost estimate for ADA doors? I just the door open. So I'm going to put that in a low expense but a high priority. We want to make sure that we get compliant. Oh yes. Seventy to eighty. So one thing um, that we did not have on here from the last time, um, but we should really think about doing in the next couple of years is the elevator replacement. Um, I know that we are looking at. Well, when it flooded several months ago, um, they came out, they fixed underneath, and then we had to replace all the like oil and the mechanics that help keep that lubricated so that it's running. Uh, but it's pretty old. I mean, anybody who's taken the elevator in there, I'd rather take the stairs when I could. So, um, so this is going to be one of those high cost ones. Maybe we'll put it in the in the middle. Not something that necessarily has to get done right away. But again, I think that goes with the building assessment as well. So. Um, we've got on here secure email. So we're going to talk to Brad about getting a cost estimate for what something like this would happen. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can't send, especially financial documents that we can't send via email because it's not secure. So there's a couple different ways. I know that I, I, um, I used Adobe has a, like a vault that you can send and it's a email that you get that you know, you click a button or whatever and it opens up a vault and you have to put in personal information um, into it before you can have access to it. So we're going to ask Brad to look into the cost of that because that would actually help with some efficiencies in the clerk's office and the finance office um, because we wouldn't necessarily have to send things through bags or make paper, paper copies. Um. Even with FOIA, I get a lot more uh, requests for video and they're, they're too big to email. So if it was somewhere we could drop it and then people could pick it up from there, it would save something. Yeah. So I'm going to stick the over here. Um, this is one I think low expense. I'm thinking in the grand scheme of, of everything here. Okay. Um, playground at the community center. We know that that's going to be about $200,000. I'm going to put that with 
the um, building assessments, but that's going to go along with that. Um, I think the floor is done, goes with the carpet. There, um, playground. So the playground right now, you guys are okay. I'm going to list as a lower priority only because we have to figure out what's going on with the water reservoir and then the community center, but we know that that's going to be kind of a higher expense. Um, so the strategic plan, I know that we had talked about, uh, there is some money right now in ARPA funds that we've talked about using for a strategic plan. A comp plan, uh, the cost estimate that we got was about $100,000. So um, our comp plan, according to CMAP, when I talked to them maybe about six months ago, is still okay, but we are going to be getting to the point where we're going to have to really take a look at our comp plan. Was the hundred thousand to do like a whole new one or to overhaul sort of an update? So we have a whole, whole new one. Yeah. So I mean, we can take a look at you know are there pieces of the comp plan that we're okay with and that maybe are still viable, and um, do we want to split that up? But to redo the whole thing would be approximately a hundred thousand dollars. So there have been some discussion about the um, sort of relevance of comp plans in general right now, or at least ones that last mm -hmm. in the ten or, or twenty you know years when things change so quickly. Um, is that still something that other towns are doing? Have we looked into sort of what, what the trend is in terms of a comprehensive plan versus strategic plan or? Correct, so that's a great question. Um, that is definitely something I think before we move forward with you know doing a comp plan is we should look at what, um, I know that sometimes when you apply for grants that you have to have a comp plan in place in order to do that. So mm -hmm. um, that's one of, that's sometimes a requirement. Um, and then, you know, if we're also talking about a strategic plan, is there a way for us to kind of combine the two so that we're, you know, with both of them, you're going to be looking at some of the similar things. So is there a way that we can combine the two of them um, in order to get the information that we want? So uh, I'm going to go ahead and put this into um, a high priority for right now so that staff can start looking at what that is because I don't think that's something that we want to necessarily, I'm not saying that it's a high priority to do the comp plan, but let's start, I think we should make it a high priority to start looking into it, um, and then we can kind of take it from there. Especially because it's something that we can get funded by a grant to do. Mm -hmm. Then um, it's something that we should yeah, try to jump on. Yeah. Um, I know we had uh, two new vehicles for public health and safety, right? So that was yours. Oh, no. just something that came up as something that we could potentially do. Um, I'm going to put it kind of like in the middle here. Um, we know that if we were to move forward with it, it would, you know, it could be as expensive as $120,000. Um, but I think that a bigger conversation has to happen before we can actually make it like a high priority versus a low priority or something that we want to move forward with at all. Okay, we did the water reservoir. Center, new tables, chairs, roof, carpet, daycare, furniture. Um, again, I think this is something that is going to go with the building assessment. I'm going to stick that here. Um, that, just a question or a comment. The, uh, you know, the community center is not necessarily um, an optimal place right now, but, but um, it would not be hard to get external funding to get new furniture for the community center as it is. So depending on how we um, prioritize the need for furniture, um, we could, I mean, depending on the state of the furniture, we could get some furniture for the community center as it exists. Okay, um, I will talk to Karen. Um, you know, if it's something that she needs stuff more immediately, then we can definitely yeah. talk about Depending that. on what it is, that's something that could, yeah. yeah. 
transition it even, you know, it was a to a new building to a model. Yeah, because yeah. long term new building might take too long and if it's a safety issue, etc. Okay. Um, you fire engine. I know there's a three year lead time. Bill, what are your estimates as far as like what do we have left on the engine that we have? Um, three to four years on the oldest one, which is a 2007. Okay. So the planning for this should start in the next year to start the planning for it with a, third, with a three year lead time. That's what it is now. Okay. Um, and then as far as cost, usually it's on delivery is what the payment would be. Okay. Um, so. And there are opportunities. You could apply for grants and stuff to try to get yep. both engines that are over there were paid for with grants. Okay. But so basically, um, you know, in order to get this piece for us in the time frame that we need it, this is where we want to make this a high priority, even though yeah. cost-wise it's not going to, you know, we're not going to necessarily have to pay anything until we get it on delivery, but it is something that over the course of the next several years, Tish and I want to make sure that we're looking at the budgets each year and we're not just all of a sudden going, oh, right, we need a million dollars, um, you know, to pay for it. It was 100% to make Yes, both of the other oh, engines were. Yeah. There's a match. Or 5%, I'm sorry, 5% yeah. match on the actual ones. Oh, okay. I, I have found other foundation grants that pay for the match. And how much time is left on the other one? Um, so oh, you said the second one? Yeah. Oh, the other one's a 2016. Okay, so that has There's time to sell. Okay. SCBA. SCBA here, here yes. So uh, I have a grant applied for this year, again with the CFG for FEMA. Um, if we don't get it this year, it should be applied for again next year, but budgeted for in fiscal year, would that be 26 then? Mm -hmm. okay. In case we don't get it, because getting parts for the ones we have now are starting to get very difficult and expensive to maintain. So, so I'm going to put this in lower expense. say it's a high priority. I mean, we don't know who we're going to hire next or whatever. I mean, currently we're lucky that our only female is a lieutenant. She happens to be sitting back there. Um, and she has her own um, quarters. quarters to sleep in. So, you know, I would say the bunk room hasn't been remodeled since it was built. Right, Steve? Is that pretty accurate? Mm -hmm. You still experience a leaks? Uh, no, not since we had to lift that. Um, but the carpet is completely worn through. Um, there's no privacy up there for anybody, so okay. I think everybody can see it. So, um, safe to say that this is a high, higher priority, probably lower cost again in the grand scheme of things. I was on the list in Springfield. Mm -hmm. You're right again. New literature. <laughs> uh, very similar situation with the engine, um, except a few years down the road. Um, it won't be officially due to be replaced until uh, 2028, but I just found out this morning that it's like a two-year lead time on that as well. But we're looking at big ticket, like as of today's dollars, depending on how it's uh, spec'd out, it's $2 million. Okay. So, so I'm going to put this By in that time, it'll probably be 2.5-ish. Yeah. So I'm going to put this in a high expense kind of in the upper part of the low priority right now. Just again, one of those things that on our radar, we need to keep it on here, but don't necessarily need to do anything with it. Um, and just so everyone is aware, we are limited with the station configuration we have with the height. We only have pretty much two options of what we can actually go with. So that's, I mean, some places can, our stick needs getting a ladder truck that's like one and a half million. That was going to be my question. Like, if you didn't have those limitations. Yeah, about a million and a half is probably what we could get it for. It's probably about a half a million dollar cost to make it the low style so it fits in the station. So. So, yeah, we should be talking about that in our building. <laughs> yeah, discussion yeah. as well. Yeah. And I'm all in the next area. I'm just kidding. And I'm going to put you on the call one more time. Call. <laughs> Second ambulance. Um, again, this was brought up at the last one. 
Um, the number of mutual aid calls we've been getting have been increasing. Uh, last year we had about 300 mutual aid ambulances into our town that actually transported. So we're missing out, not, not that this is the only option, or the only reason that we're missing out on the billing for that, but eventually the mutual aid towns are going to say, why are we supplementing Forest Park? Why don't they have their own second ambulance if they need it? You know, they're tying, you know, North Riverside and River Forest are sending us their ambulance to help us for our multiple calls. Yeah. You know, so we're tying up their We're ambulance. tying up their ambulance, and they're having increased costs and increased wait times for their residents because of us. So, so at some point, we're going to have to, you know, they'll never tell us, no, we can't come, but there is that pressure. So. Would the second ambulance require additional staffing? Uh, staffing, a place to put it, and an ambulance. So, I mean, you're talking yeah. obviously big dollars because we can't house one in our current small station. So, there's a lot to it. But that's something that's going to have to be thought about. Um, you know, just strictly call volume. Again, we're, we're higher numbers this year so far than we have been in the past couple of years so far. So. Are you still seeing the majority <coughs> coming out of the train stations? Not a majority. We. Uh, that number is consistent now. It's right around 500 to 550 calls a year. Um, and that ebbs and flows with the weather. So. One of my questions about uh, that's related to this about revenue is um, I found out River Forest is billing at their calls at uh, 3,500. Mm -hmm. And I think we're billing less. Yes, 2,700. Yeah. Dollars. We so cannot change. It's That is fixed off of what our costs are. Oh. Every year we have a cost survey done, okay. and <coughs> off that report, this is for Medicaid, okay. and we can only bill that amount. Like River Forest costs are way higher than ours okay. uh, per call because they run less calls than we do. Oh. So if we ran more calls, our cost per call is going to go down. No. Okay. Less calls, the cost goes yeah. up. So that's how that works. Uh, okay, because we're doing more. Okay, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Um, and then I, I have found a grant that would cover part of the, at least part of the cost of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I, I have sourced that, but obviously the staffing and where to put it would be part of yeah, that as well. So. talking about um, Stella and I are actually going to start working on an RFP uh, for this project. This will do serve two things. Um, one, it'll give a more accurate reading to the village for what water is actually being used. Um, it'll also help the residents because uh, the system that we're looking at will allow each water account holder to look at their account in real time. So. Right now, um, if you are not aware that you have a water leak, you don't necessarily see that until you get your water bill. And we only bill every other month. Um, so we get a lot of people who come into the clerk's office and they are like, oh my gosh, I, what is going on? Um, our, our water department is great. They will go out, they will look at your, at your water system and you know they can help you determine if you're having a leak. But people don't understand how much a little toilet leak um, can actually play on your water bill. And so this will actually allow you to look at your water bill in real time. You can set up alerts that if your water consumption usage is at a certain level, it'll give you an alert so that you can notify, um, you can see right away that, oh, wait a minute, something's, something's off here. I need to maybe take a look at my toilet, see if I have a shower, take a look at you know internal plumbing to see if there's a leak. So this is something that we would like to do sooner rather than later. Um, Tish and I have talked about some funding options that you know we could potentially do with this. It will be um, a full town water meter change out. Uh, so this is definitely a high expense, but I think it is something that in the long run um, will be better for everybody in the village, both on the village hall side of it and the residents you know, on their end of it. So, We'd like to start looking at this um, soon. Uh, public's roof, public works roof, um, it rains over there when it rains. <laughs> it rains in public works. So, um, you know, I told Sal, we have to, we have to get it fixed. Um, I know this year we spent a lot of time, um, you know, fixing the roofs at 
the police department because they also had a leak that continued to leak even after we fixed it. And so um, Public Works has taken on a lot of rainy water this year and, you know, hasn't complained. So I think that, you know, along with the building assessments, this is something that we should definitely pay attention to um, and maybe even try to get fixed in this coming fiscal year. Um, Sale has put a couple things on here. I just wanted, since he's not here, to, to talk about these. Um, you know, department heads were asked to give their pie in the sky uh, ideas. So he went ahead and he assessed everything that he has in there, just like the other department heads have as well. Um, so uh, he's going to need a forestry truck at some point. Um, he estimated that at about $170,000. I'm going to put it in the metal here. And the important thing about this forestry truck is that it's a combined truck that, okay, well, <laughs> go ahead. We're it's your already seeing savings yeah. because they have two separate trucks that they use now. And to replace those, which are both in horrible shape, um, we'd be looking at closer to like a four or $500,000 investment. Um, whereas I'd asked him if these combined trucks could work for the purposes, you know, that they, they use them for. Mm -hmm. And um, he said that, yeah, he'd love to have that. So, you know, those clock in at you know, significantly less money. So, I mean, it's already paying for it. So, what is, one of them is like the boom, and then what's the other kind of combination? I, it's like hauling and chipping or something. Oh, the chipper? Yeah. And it has a, it has the, like a bin and a chipper and then. But it's all, yeah, in one, one, okay. one truck. Which is also good for like everybody's running out of storage space to park vehicles. Um, so it, it's kind of if this works for them, it, it is a good investment, I think. Okay. Um, I'm going to take his PW fleet replacement plan again. You know, this is kind of over the course of the next several years. I know that we have a fleet replacement program that we started, and so this will help us in kind of plotting out the next several of years, so that um, along with like the police department vehicles and then public health and safety, we can see, you know, over the course of the next several years how many vehicles we need, what we need to um, utilize to fund that account, and what we can actually pay for and how we can, you know, give our department heads some kind of heads up as to when they can potentially expect to be able to get some yeah. new uh, We're starting to compile a lot more data too and just yes. like to get some help and like really starting to process all of that so mm -hmm. it's more digestible for everybody. Yeah. So I'm going to put it in high priority just because it won't necessarily be anything that was spent in a large expense at once, um, but I think it's something that we need to start. We need to continue talking about for sure. And certainly, fixing the roof will um, help to maintain the current fleet. Yes, for sure. Um, I know we have underground infrastructure upgrades and water sewer. Um, you know, as part of our VIP program, we try to you know undertake some type of infrastructure <coughs> program when we can. Um, you know, it's this is kind of ongoing. So uh, again, this is going to kind of be in a, I'm gonna put it in a low priority just because I, I think, you know, one of the things that uh, former village administrator Dylan did was, um, you know, our alleys are really, really well spread out as far as when they need to be fixed. They did a good job. Um, over the course of his term of, you know, making sure that year by year we stayed on top of fixing something, um, you know, as well as our, our streets. Uh, the sewers underneath, you know, we still need to take, we, we still have a lot of work to do with the sewers and we're obviously continuing to incorporate our sewer system as we can go on. Um, but I feel like that is like a ultra long term kind of plan that we have going on. So we are able to budget for that a little bit better. Um, Okay, police department, squad car, car fleet. I know, Chief, we've gotten a couple of new cars for you um, recently, uh, but we've talked, the Chief and I have talked about, you know, he's got older vehicles, and one of the things that Commissioner Vogt had mentioned was um, one of the things that George, the mechanic, has started doing this year is anytime he fixes any of our public works any of our police department, any vehicle that we have. Um, we actually have a program where he puts in what the uh, parts were and what the labor was so that we can see on any specific 
vehicle, Fit Squad 617, for instance. Any work that he's done on it, we can go into this program and we can say, okay, you know, in the last year, we've put $1,000 into this vehicle. Um, as we continue to do that, what we're going to want to take a look at is, um, over the course of time, how much are we putting into these vehicles? And then um, also comparing that to the age of the vehicle. Uh, eventually, what we would like to do is be able to stop using these vehicles when they maybe still have some value to them um, and get on a rotation so that we're not at this place where we were last year where all of a sudden, you know, we're having to request, you have requested seven vehicles through, through our, through our book. It was seven. Yeah. And, you know, just to, I'm, uh, as an example, we had uh, four cars come in through the ARPA program that weren't upfitted yet. And I still had some of the old fleet that I didn't complete. Uh, a patrol ship at a minimum is, is five officers. I had five available squad cars to patrol the streets. So I mean, it's, it's a function of what we do. It's the offices for our officers. And there's a lot of police departments hiring. And if we're not offering it, uh, if we're not taking care of the human resource with a nice office, they can go elsewhere. And, they, and I haven't seen it yet because I, I think we do a good job keeping people. And, and, with retention, but someone might go for money or, or nicer cars, nicer equipment. And uh, little things like that, I think yeah. we could help keep some of this younger crowd that's tempted to, to leave. I mean, like what you said, those are their offices. They don't have a desk here at Village Hall. Um, you know, that's what they go in and they are, they are using them for eight hours a day and then somebody new is coming in. I mean, those squad cars are used 24 seven. So um, I think that's something that, um, Again, kind of over time, I think it is a high priority, but we can make it a lower cost thing if we are able to plan forward and spread it across time and plan for it. So yeah. then it won't necessarily be that high expense, hey, you know, we just lost four or five squad cars due to various things. Um, yeah. To try to not make it an emergency, to make it something that it's planned yeah. for. And, and the majority of that funding is ARPA and your. Um, Seizure fund or? Well, seizure funds, we, we did one. We were doing, uh, we did a car for uh, one of our detectives through our, our seizure fund. Um, and I thought with the, the vehicle purchase plan, they were taking money out of our admin toes. Yeah, we have, uh, there's a separate fund called the police vehicle fund. So out of the admin toes and some um, out of the money that comes from some of the county fines um, goes in there. But that, Currently, I think there's a loan on that account right now. We're not sure how much longer we're we'll talking about that one. A couple of years, I think. Um, does George's report also include any of the subcontracting work, or is this just so his hours and material? That is what Sal and I were talking about on Friday. And he was going, when he talked to George, it was anything that he had information for. Okay. So if he sent a car out, or to a subcontractor, he could put it in there. But okay. if somebody else was, like, so when the fire department, you yeah. know, there are certain things that only a certain, like, he can't do, and only you guys send it out to, you know, the specialty. Those aren't necessarily incorporated okay. in there. And so that's something that we can look at, um, you know, getting that information into it so that we can have that data available mm -hmm. next year um, and really get a sense of how much we're spending on, the, on our vehicles. Yeah. yeah, we should have that perspective on all of our vehicles Um, one of the things we do have to uh, consider with that is Public Works does not have an admin assistant, and George is a one-man show. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if that is something that we want to consider, uh, we're also going to have to talk about the workforce as far as, you know, who's putting in that information, who's keeping that data, who's assisting with that. Uh, yeah. Public Works also doesn't have an admin assistant. I'm glad you brought that up, because that so. is something that I wanted to talk about. I didn't put it up there. I didn't know... Um, Today was the day, but I, I want to evaluate what an additional person there could be. If it's maybe not strictly administrative, but it's managerial with some administrative and data analysis. Like um, I was trying to formulate what that would look like because they do need that um, help down there. Um, and then, you know, before when there was um, an administrative assistant down there, I think they were doing like the water billing and that kind of thing. So. I wanted to have that sort of a, that conversation and just see what that would look like, um, especially as we start moving towards computers and data. Like somebody's got to be able to manage that and, and be able to 
you know, Sal's trying to get all the GIS information in there and stay up to date with the trees, and he wants to update the sewers, and mm -hmm. you know, that is um, an expense we talked about that maybe she was gonna see if there's grant funding for that, but completing the input of all of the sewer um, mapping, mm -hmm. um, I think, you want me to write it down? Okay. That might be a, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna um, put it as low expense but high priority so that we can take a look at that yeah. and see yeah. if that is something that we need to add, you know, is that, is that a full-time position, is that a part-time position, is it something that we can incorporate into staff that we already have, but that's a, a, a good thing to look at. I know he has, um, uh, he has uh, selflessly, you know, taken on a lot of those responsibilities um, since Katie left, because uh, Katie was the one who was, was kind of doing that, and um, you know, he doesn't he doesn't complain a lot about it, but it is something that he does he needs some help with. So, so if we're talking about additional staff, and I, this might not even be relevant right now to this discussion, maybe it's more of a strategic plan discussion. Um, but you know, I've been thinking of a lot of towns lately have been hiring communications full time people, which I know we don't have the budget for right now. Um, but I think that's a really important role. Um, when you say possibly. communications, do you mean like they social do media? Social media, newsletter, PR, 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 all that kind of stuff like that, um, which could potentially be done by people we already have, but I think we're really stretched really thin. Um, and then the other thing is uh, economic development. Some kind of, a lot of towns also are hiring mm -hmm. economic development specialists. So I don't know, I, you know, I know we're not in the place right now to decide to do that, but in the next few years, those are a couple things I would like to think about. So, um, along with what Chief Chupai was talking about, the PD is also in a situation where they could use some reconfiguration of their facility as well. Um, they also have locker rooms that don't fit the needs of their officers. Um, they have an increasing number of female officers who are joining the workforce, which is wonderful. Um, but you can't fit them all in the locker room. If they were all on the same shift, it would be a pretty tight squeeze. Um, in addition to the fact that the chief had mentioned last time, our lockers are, um, the ones that we have are just, they're, they're somewhat deplorable. Um, and you know, as you talked about, one of the things that we really can strive for is keeping our employees here um, by providing them with, you know, some, doesn't have to be the state of the art facility, but, um, we also shouldn't necessarily be happy with like 1960s or 1970 um, like quarters. Say, like I'd say that be a short term, long term. So like short term, maybe just locker replacement, mm -hmm. which is I think, I have to remember like forty thousand. Yeah. Um, and then longer term, so three to five down the road, what a uh, rehab. Body cameras in the state mandate. And I noticed on here, I, I made a mistake. Um, I believe 2026 is when the warranty is going to run out. Off of our current cameras. And I, I hit 2027 last time, so it's still kind of turning. Um, okay, so this is one of those items that you know we need to start thinking about now because we're going to have to. You know, we were ahead of the curve. Um, it's the mandate starts this. For, for us, it would have been 2025, and we um, actually implemented them in 20. Yes. So we were ahead of the curve, but that also means we're also ahead of the curve on the five year warranty that is going to be coming up. So we're going to put that under high priority. How many uh, cameras do we are we going to need? We have 30, I think it's 33. Um, unless we look into something like to start replacing in pieces like early 5 5, 5 5, 5 5, mm -hmm. and just keep cycling. Do you, do you have a number for the uh, showers that we have that you want to do? No, we never had anyone come in because I, I wasn't going to get a quote for something that wasn't going to happen this year. Because then, uh, you know, projected three years down the road, I don't know, I'm guessing prices are going to go up. And it'd be a hefty job, I don't think. The only way to do that is, is to hire an architect to develop a scope so that we can cost everything out. Um, taser replacement. That's uh, Taser changed their the way they do business. They went to a subscription service. The Tasers we have were all bought at once, and I believe it was through a grant um, before I was deputy chief or chief. 
Um, so with the subscription, there were two options. One in the long, uh, after five years, it's uh, 120,000. I think the other one was about 100,000. I've got them in the, the budget sheets I gave uh, Tish. Um, That's a year? No, no, that was over five years. So okay, just so divided by, divide by five. And that was with all the, the cartridge replacements with training tasers and uh, uh, everything we need actually to email. So it's tasers for all the officers, the add-on is for training, for, so for certifying the officers, which we have to do annually, duty cartridge for each officer in the department, um, and then free refills. Well, I guess it's technically not free, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chief, would you say that is a high priority when you take I'd say the time? tire because that's a, a tool that we probably save in our officers and our arrestees from getting hurt when we have to get that situation. Can I? Can I uh, future, until I, until I have staff that time. Okay. Uh, prisoner cell updates. I know that's an expensive one, um, and it is something that we should definitely start thinking about. Um, I think the last time they were even painted was probably 20 years ago. Uh, like I stated, the last time in order to access the water, um, it, it's so they're cinder blocks, so you have the jail cell on one side, and on the PD side in their reporting room, they have a piece as a panel, like a piece of plywood, um, there, where there's a hole in the cinder block. Um, and you know, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, oh, okay. Um, so I think that's something that is going to be a high expense. I don't want to say that it's a low priority, but it goes along with the building assessments that uh, we need to kind of do this this whole section do yeah. this with as well. Mm -hmm. So um, cameras and LPRs, we have been doing these. Um, we started doing these last year. Um, we, I know we have a couple more that we, we want to put up. Um, parts for our cost report for the ambulance. And they pull the record of how much gas was spent on 408. Mm -hmm. So I do know that it's, at least for that, it's capable of that fuel master they get yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. So. I guess that is an example. Right. You know, just like, can we, are, are we able to be accountable to the stuff that we are spending already? Like 250, 260 is a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and just a few of those other things um, per department. Um, I'm going to put this kind of in the middle. I have some ideas that 
I think right now um, I could maybe start on some things, so that would be a low expense in looking at it. Um, I will just put it here so it's on your radar. Okay, and then um, walk life, drive, street safety improvements, implementation, um, and improvement planning. Um, okay, discussion since that was something that. Uh, it just, it, you know, there's, I know there are things that um, the Traffic and Safety Commission is working on that, um, and we will be working on that are responsive to uh, the uh, residents um, that I think will. Um, you know, uh, cost not a lot of money, but benefit uh, safety and, and improvements in town, and, and uh, uh, so it's just something I think will we'll have um, a lot of benefit, uh, and it's something that, you know, will happen over time, okay. uh, painting, signs, uh, improving quality of life for residents, improving the health and safety. Of, uh, are you okay with me putting this in the kind of upper, lower, low priority, but low expense, and not, and, and when I mean yeah. low priority, I no, don't mean that it like falls off the, the no, it's, right it's, 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 it's in the, it's in the realm of even. whatever, it just, it's something uh, that hasn't, it, it didn't appear on, you know, yeah. what was being discussed, but it's something that hasn't been consistently, you know, it's, it, you know, when I talk to Sal, like, oh, this is happening a little more often than has been in the last so. Uh, does that include, um, and I don't know at what point the Traffic and Safety Commission needs to bring in, like, let's say a, a traffic engineer, right? So can we decide just to put up a stop sign because there's, you know, resident input that there should be a stop sign and maybe Kenny can, uh, I'm sorry, Chief Gross could maybe <laughs> no, get on this too. There's a process. There's an established yeah. process so, for so all of So that includes all of the, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Not to interrupt. Yeah. Does anybody else <laughs> have anything else that they want to add? I mean, this is just a start by all means. Yeah. You know, if things come up during the year, um, you know, this is kind of a multi-year process. And, you know, next year we'll take a look at these things and see what, what can be removed because we accomplished them, um, you know, and then we'll take a look at what needs to be reprioritized, um, what things unfortunately moved up to a high expense because we waited on it or um, that's my goal by doing this is to not be in that position in the future, that something doesn't become an emergency that, you know, we've planned out for it. So um, if, if this looks like, okay, we didn't really do very much, I, I fully understand this in my head. Um, and I can, you know, at some point we'll be able to kind of get this to look a little bit more than just like post it on. Oh, this is fantastic. Start. Yeah. I have a question. Um, when we're talking about the building, the building needs and the building assessments that have been done, mm -hmm. when can we, I don't know if now's the time to decide, we need to sit down as a council and talk about those assessments that were done and I think that's going to help us. Yes. prioritize this too. So in terms of this budget meeting, where is that going to fall time-wise, you know? Um, I mean, I think that's something that we can start doing soon. Um, I wasn't prepared to do that necessarily tonight. No, not tonight. Um, for sure. But I think that it's something that, you know, we can definitely, mm -hmm. you know, put something in motion, um, you know, between now and the next six months, um, if not sooner. It's be <clears throat> the nature of like, I haven't checked, you know, we haven't checked in on the comprehensive plan and we haven't done it. So, like, we have, I think, a lot of meetings ahead of us. Um, I think the building um, assessment, that discussion is going to have to take place over a couple different meetings yeah. and, you know, the strategic planning, all of that. And, I mean, it, it, it is what it is at this point. Um, but it, I do think we should have that, start planning those building yeah. meetings soon. For sure, and we can start it at a regular council meeting, and if it if it's something that is more you know labor intensive, and that we can you know schedule out a separate meeting, um, and you know so that we have like an allotted time, or we have we can focus on it, and it's not in the middle of trying to do council business. If we're looking at staffing, I think that um, the finance department needs another person. I would agree. I think Commissioner Bell was talking about you know needing people to kind of help with some of this data input and all of that. Um, you know, Tish and I have talked about the responsibilities that have fallen on the finance department of two. Um, I, I would actually say almost one and a half because uh, her finance assistant also assists in um, what would be categorized as 
you know, human resources in the sense that she does payroll and benefits. And she, yeah, and she, and like she does a lot of that. Of her time. Correct. So, um, you know, that is something that Director Olmstead and I have talked about, um, you know, over the last six months. Um, and then I would definitely agree that uh, Director Stella needs somebody, um, you know, back there. I know that uh, in the police department, their staffing needs have kind of changed on the civilian side of it. Um, things like the body cameras have brought about responsibilities that, you know, have gotten reassigned to one of our parking enforcement officers. And so he is off the street as a parking, off parking enforcement officer because maintaining the um, body cameras has become now a full-time job and he helps with like the FOIAs for the video requests and all of that. So, um, you know, our, our staffing is definitely going to be a conversation that I think that we should have in the next year. Um, if we talk about adding a second ambulance, that is going to be something that, you know, we have to be able to staff that. Um, you know, with that will also come if we have a second ambulance and we're able to keep those calls more in-house as opposed to using mutual aid, it will also bring in more income for us. So, you know, we can try to balance that out uh, to see if it'll actually end up paying for itself. But um, times are changing and, you know, we are at a point where, you know, you can only do more with less so much and so well. Um, and I think we have to start having the serious conversations of are we actually doing it well? Um, or are we taxing the people that we have here? Um, overtaxing them and that, uh, you know, we're not, we're not being efficient because we've got too much on people's plates. So something to talk about in the future. Do you or the mayor have an update on reimbursement from the CTA for the ambulance room? We received word that some money was appropriated and was intended uh, to go to the village for the uh, time and effort that we spend um, responding to the CTA. Um, and it's about $1.5 million. There will probably be some time before we actually have the money. All right. Um, I remind you, but I thought this was the easy part. Um, so um, the revenue idea. Uh, Commissioner, Mill, Commissioner Miller, do you guys have anything you want to add to this? Yeah, but the, the ambulance idea we okay. talked about. Okay, so we've got the ambulance ideas, um, parking meter, parking app, maximize full capacity, ensure they are working for credit cards. I have, I yeah, I have encountered um, at times where uh, the parking meters have not consistently worked with credit cards. I just got an email actually from and, a gentleman who said the same thing. Yeah, and then um, I would like to make sure or explore how the app, because um, sometimes I've used the app and I'd like to, so it. it um, I think the app is fabulous, um, but I have. Uh, you know, our, I'd like to look at how long the our hours are and, and make the app more useful for residents. Okay. Explore brand new ideas there. Okay. What was the first thing? Um, ambulance revenue for like the revenue charges, mm -hmm. um, which you yeah. two had it and explained that. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah it's kind of based on what we charge is based on the number of vendors. Yeah. And then um, I have uh, done some research uh, and looked at grants available. Just just did a uh, search, just a one comprehensive search in the databases that I have available to me, and I have found um, pretty much uh, about two million dollars worth of revenue in uh, potential grants in uh, for foundations, just foundations. Um, well, but I think that this, like, yeah. once we compile, once yeah. you know, this gets compiled in um, in a more comprehensive way, that'll be a great way to start looking at the grants because yeah. um, I, my experience in the past has kind of been, you know, each of the departments maybe on their own are you know looking to see, oh, you know, I need a new fire ambulance, you know, you're, you're they're familiar with the the ambulance grants that are out yeah. there, but um, that was one of the things I wanted to kind of get out of us all talking together. Yeah. Um, was, okay, here's a string, here's a list of things that we're looking for. Um, you know, can we work with our grant writers? Can we work with you to really see what's out there? Um, you know, as opposed to a grant coming up and us <coughs> going, oh, wait a minute, yeah, maybe we should apply for that or, you know, um, ding, ding, ding. 
Well, and I guess the, just the point I'm saying is that, you know, there are grants out there that cover full costs mm -hmm. of um, items that we're looking for. Now. And I think grants have this idea that um, we always have to have cost share. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. And um, there are things that we can cover on grants like salaries. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's also uh, something that we can use more uh, as a village. Okay, I'm going to put that under long-term high priority. <coughs> Obviously, we have to be aware that this is putting a burden on the business owner. 
um, for the separate reporting to the village and their time is well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a huge. Okay. Um, I'm just going to kind of start taking these out here. I'm actually parking. I know this is something that has, that has come up. There's different ways that we can go about this. Um, you know, I don't think that, I think we've, we've talked about some ideas. Uh, definitely have started looking at some local municipalities uh, about, you know, different ideas that can happen. Um, it is something that I know is needed in town. Um, you know, I mean, you have all been present when people have issues being able to get a parking spot in one of our municipal lots. Um, and so again, this is something else that we can, you know, take a look at. And I think it's something that we could probably do in the short term. I'm, yeah, I'm definitely in favor of looking at um, Pond Street parking ideas for residents, yeah. Uh, fire inspections annually. Do you want to talk about that? Okay, so I was talking with Bob McDermott, and North Riverside does this. When, they, when the businesses pay for their business license, they get charged, it's $125 which gets them an annual inspection and then a reinspection included on that. If, they have, if the fire inspector has to come back another time after a reinspection, meaning they found a deficiency, came back, it still wasn't fixed, and had to come back a second time after that initial inspection, then they would get charged $75 for that second inspection. This just covers the cost of the inspections. Um, we don't have as many inspector businesses as North Riverside. Mm -hmm. Ballpark around these numbers, if we did this, it would be between twenty and thirty thousand dollars in revenue. But the one problem is, is our inspectors, with them only being part time, are not getting into every single business every year. So somebody would be paying for it and possibly not getting. It. Not to say that they might be happy they're not getting an inspection, you know. But it's you know they're not getting what they're paying for. It, so that's yeah. part of the problem. Okay. So, <coughs> so that would be for every business. <coughs> um, long-term low priority. Okay. And I mean, like, when I, when I say long-term, I mean more of, like, over the next several years, not, like, 20 years from now, just something that we don't necessarily have to do right away. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to take this Denver boot, and I'm going to put it in, um, short-term, I'm going to put it in high priority only because the chief Gross and I have actually already started working on um, an amnesty program that we'd like to present mm -hmm. to the council in the coming weeks. Um, we do have a lot of people who have not paid their parking tickets. Um, and we would like to um, offer some type of program that allows people who are not in collections yet to uh, take care of those tickets without necessarily having the full extent of like, all the late fees that have been Um what we're finding um, is that when we stopped booting, and, and I believe we stopped booting during COVID, um, so there's definitely a good reason for that, but if there's no consequence to not paying your parking ticket, people just don't pay it. Um, and, you know, it, it's kind of then defeating of the, of the purpose to a certain extent. Um, and so, you know, we're having to keep up on those records and we're sending people out. Um, we also get complaints from you know, residents who, uh, you know, people are getting, continue to do the same behaviors, and so we're not really changing anything um, if there isn't kind of like a final outcome to a behavior that we don't want to. So, um, again, that's just something that we'll be able to present to you in the, in the coming weeks, and so we'll make sure that we get council input on that. Um, Megan has actually done some research as well on what area municipalities have offered for their amnesty programs. So we're gonna kind of take a look at that and see what we can come up with and have a conversation as to what that program could look like. Um, okay, with that, compliant with tickets before on street parking, I think Vanessa, this is yours, right? Yeah. I was just saying that other towns, you can't call your car in if you have outstanding tickets. Mm -hmm. Namely, Oak Park. They make you hang up, pay your tickets, and call back. Mm -hmm. wow. okay. They also charge seven dollars. 
for additional parking passes, correct? Okay. I'm going to stick this with um, on street parking because I think the two go hand in hand with that. So <coughs> there's a couple on here that kind of all go together. So I mean, fee increases, business license fees, um, user fees, um, uh, taxi driver fees. So um, yeah, those are all, those are all the best. Um, but I, to, to be fair to Clerk Moretz, um, you know, she sent me a memo this morning, and as um, Mr. Sullivan had stated, business license fees have not been updated in 17 years. It's probably time for us to, to take a look at that. Um, just the cost that is involved with the village clerk's office and the finance department's um, time to invoice, put it in the, to put it in the computer, to create the invoice, to mail the invoices out, um, to follow up with the businesses, to you know all the paperwork that's involved in making sure that they do have the that they do have their business licenses, um, and then following up to make sure that everybody is compliant. Um, you know, I mean, we're, we're not charging we're not charging probably what it takes to actually do that. So um, I, I don't think it would be far off to say that we're probably losing money when you take into staff time that has to be spent um, on an annual basis to do this. So. Uh, she has made some recommendations to me that, again, I'll be presenting to the Village Council. Um, I, I think given the fact that it's been 17 years, uh, that there's definitely some fee increases that are going to be warranted. Um, some of the other things are um, taxi drivers, they get background checks, you know, the police department is involved in that. Uh, and again, um, the fees are $10. $10. You know, I mean, that's not even covering the cost of for the liquor license holders, we charge a, a lot more than that to do. I mean, it's it's more of a, it's a comprehensive background investigation, but um, you know, we're just we're not covering our costs, and I think this is a good time to kind of take a look at uh, you know all of those fees and make sure that you know we're not here necessarily to make money, but we don't want to lose money either. So, um, dog, same thing with the dog fee, dog park user fees. Um, the keys itself are how much were they? Eight dollars. Eight dollars. Um, and we charge twenty dollars for a permit, um, <coughs> so we're only getting twelve dollars to me per dog user to maintain that. So all the malls and also we get a tag, a dog tag, yeah. So, register. And I don't even know if we were covering the cost of the key completely if they lost. No, they have to pay twenty dollars if they lose their key. Okay. Or so. I think it is twenty dollars. Okay. Actually. So I'm going to put this in short term. Maybe it's high ten, priority. I think it's fair that um, you know that we take a look at that. We just did that with the liquor license fees. It's a good idea to take a look at that, and then again, kind of start a schedule, um, you know, as so that you know maybe it's every two years or every three years we're we're taking a look at all of these and seeing where we're at, and then the increases will be incremental and they won't be as drastic, um, you know, because we're not waiting 17 years before we have to make these changes. Um, okay. Water meters, I know we had talked about, so I'm going to put that in short term high priority. Uh, let's see here. Some of these are. See, what was Wade's policy <coughs> for service per truck? Um, so we charge a flat business license fee for a waste hauler, and some other towns charge per service. So if Flood Brothers has 15 buildings where they pick up in Forest Park, they pay per service. Okay. I'm going to stick that with the fees. And per truck. Okay, so we'll take a look at that with the, with the general fees. And, um, let's go with Airbnb and entertainment tax. Now, um, we don't have hotels, so we don't have any hotels to do a hotel tax on. Um, but I know the conversation has come up in the past as to whether or not we should be taking a look at regulating our Airbnbs yes. that we have in the village. So um, I'm just putting this out there. This was a revenue idea and wanted to kind of get the council's sense of whether or not this is something you wanted staff to take a look at. We're we waiting to find out what happened with the lawsuit in another town. Wasn't there 
some other. Uh, not being non home rule, legal has always told us. That we, yeah, that's kind of what I have been told as well. Was, we should get that, because this comes up every budget yeah, meeting, yeah. and we're always like, I'm not sure, because it might be non home rule. Like, we should get that definitive okay. um, answer. Okay. I think regulating it as we can mm -hmm. is good for not only revenue, but for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, and I know even places like Airbnb. Yeah, I had a I had a meeting with a Forest Park business owner um, whose uh, uh, family member has uh, works for Airbnb, and uh, their preference is to work with municipalities that uh, that uh, right. regulate um, their local mm -hmm. Airbnbs. Sorry, right, I'll put that up here so we can yeah. one at least get an answer as to whether it's something we can do, and then if it is something that we can do, we can take a look at it. Yeah. Um, along with that, then, is home rule. Um, one of the things that I brought up, uh, Commissioner Manson and I have talked about this, Mayor Hoskins and I have talked about this a little bit, uh, Director Olmstead and I were talking about how if home rule is something that we want to look at, it would have to go on the ballot. Um, to get it on the ballot in November of 2025, we would have had to start working on it like last month. Um, so it's still an option. Um, it's just we are looking for you know some consensus from the council as to whether this is something that you want us to start looking into and start um, you know, finding out how to go about doing this. I mean, we, we know what needs to happen, but there's just a lot that has to take place. Um, we were given about a year, year and a half timeline if we wanted to do this effectively. Um, and I would recommend that we also um, engage some type of PR um, company to help assist us with this. Um, and the IML also, yes. I don't know if it's for a cost or not, but they offer a service where they come in and um, can help the village put everything together. Yes. Town hall meetings, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So we haven't taken a deep dive into this, and so we've really just kind of done like a very shallow look at it. Um, so we're here now. Yeah. Put it on the table and see what Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, you can say PR, or you could just say education. Like, I think it's important to look at what a change like that would mean for Forest Park, and I think it could be significant. But, you know, at the end of the day, to get the voters to agree to a change like this, you're asking them to put more power in the hands of their local government, and you need an exceptional level of trust yeah. from the voters. And so, if they don't have that trust, if they hear their elected officials interested in ignoring their will, or you know, not going to listen to them and you know what they ask for, mm -hmm. it's going to be really hard to get trust like that back. Absolutely. Um, I think the educational piece is is huge. Um, it's, it's pretty much everything in you know getting our residents to understand what exactly home rule is um, and the powers that it does give your local government. Um, and I think there's there are several misconceptions out there that can be uh, rectified through education. So um, I'm getting a sense that this is something that you want staff to start working on. And the elected officials have to do their work to. Yeah, it'll definitely be a team effort on both, you know, staff and the council's part. That Show the community they can trust them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh -oh. yeah. Um, okay, talk to Republic or other vendors for electronic recycling. Um, I think this. I'm going to leave this off because I think that one might have come from sale. Um, and we're working on that. Okay, so we've got a grant funded in out here. Okay. Um, water bill operations fee. So this has come up several times um, when we talk about our water infrastructure. Uh, other communities, I know North Riverside in particular, does charge a water operator's fee because we are the, the um, utility actually providing water service to um, our residents. So in the water fees, we charge what Chicago charges the village for water, and there's a minimal fee that's also added in. Um, you know, we do the water billing. We do, uh, you know, we have Rick and Steve who are our water department. You know, um, anybody, anytime anybody comes up, those two, no questions asked, they go out to a house and they will, you know, take a look at your water meter. Um, obviously, we're hoping with the water meter changeouts, if we do that, that you know, that will 
happen less because people will have more access to their own water service. Um, but this goes in line with the unfunded mandate of flood service um, as well. So um, separate from the water meters, we do have to make sure that all of our lead service feeds in town um, get changed out to copper. So um, in look, you know, we have, we obviously know we're looking for grants. We've applied for an IEP of water loan, um, but this is something that we can, you know, take a look at and again bring back to the council as far as you know a couple of different options that we can do that would help generate um, some revenue. Uh, and really, it would be to generate revenue to, to put back into the water infrastructure program that we have. I mean, when we're looking at this, we're not looking at this to, you know, necessarily have the general fund so that, you know, we can do all kinds of crazy things. This is, this is really just um, seeking additional funds to help us get our water infrastructure back to where it, or get it up to speed to where it really needs to be. So I'm going to put this here because I know we've, we've kind of already started uh, looking at that. Um, if I could add, and like, we'll see if anything comes of it, but mm -hmm. I know in like every discussion we had in Springfield, um, as other communities were involved, like over and over and over again, it came up like, sure, we can add these additional fees to pay for this, but we want your help so that that's not our first like line of, <laughs> yes. of, of paying for this. Yes. Um, we don't want to have to be you know, putting the burden on our Absolutely. residents. And it seemed like it was falling on receptive years, but yes. it did come up every room I was in again and again and again. So hopefully we will see more money. Yeah, and that's what, I mean, I think we, it's, it's important to say to for everybody out in the audience that, you know, nobody wants to be able to do this. Um, but unfortunately, you know, governments that are above us um, are mandating us to do things for good or for, you know, for better or for worse. I mean, I, I lead service is a really important thing to do. Um, and it should be something that, you know, unfortunately, we got ourselves into this position many, many years ago when they allowed lead pipes. Um, and it's something that we have to correct. So we are also doing our part to get our legislators to help us with these. Um, but we may have to, you know, unfortunately, turn to the residents to help us with us. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this up, but uh, leaf removal program. Uh, so currently, the Village of Forest Park collects leaves from uh, September, October uh, through you know December first. Uh, we <coughs> sweep every night. We sweep <coughs> piles of leaves into the, the intersections, and then we pick up. Um, we have estimated that that service, because we have to pay for the dumping of the leaves, in addition to the fact that you know we have to pay staff to come in. Um, and do the street sweeping, and then we have to pick up, I believe staff said it was like 60 to $80,000. $80,000 so $80. $80, um, a year. Um, and the question came up as to why we do this, because we also, um, everybody who pays for uh, their garbage bill also pays for unlimited leaf collection. So um, when we do this, we're actually paying twice for this service. Um, now, granted, when the village does it, it's a chore that doesn't necessarily, um, you know, it, it, we do realize it helps out seniors, it helps out people who have mobility issues, um, but it is a costly thing uh, that we do pay twice for. So this is uh, a conversation that I think we want to, you know, take some time to have, really kind of look at the benefits versus the you know, the cons, how this is going to affect the neighborhood. I know Oak Park recently changed to bagging their leaves um, mm -hmm. for pickup. Um, and, I, you know, I've kind of been following the pros and the cons and how the residents over there feel as well. So before we take on such a drastic change, if that's what we choose to do, I really think it would be important to um, engage the community in, in this. Um, because for some of us, it's not going to be that big of a deal, but for others, it will be a really big deal. Um, so I think that that's something that, you know, in the coming months, we should really kind of start talking about mm -hmm. and, you know, getting feedback from the community on like how we should do that. Because it, it taxes is infrastructure as well, you know, it, no matter what good of a job or how, how well they do, um, you know, that debris ends up in our sewers and that sort of thing. And the piles of leaves can be a safety issue. We saw... Um, unfortunately, one person in Oak Park parked on a pile of leaves and burned their car. Um, so, yeah, well, uh, I, I, you yeah. know, in sight and all the, you know, other issues. So it, it, it is something to, it's a serious conversation to have for multiple reasons. Is there any way to eliminate these funds on the other end so that we could stop paying for the 
So we could keep paying for the, you know, pick up in the street, but stop paying for the. So we'd have to um, eliminate yard waste. So it's all inclusive with the yard waste. So the yard waste that we use April through, you know, November, it's all inclusive in that. Our contract with our garbage company is that it's unlimited bags. Okay. So the, the leaves could hypothetically be put in bags or um, yard waste. Okay. So I think the biggest issue that comes to mind is just those with mobility issues. Uh, are, it's going to be a huge change for them, and I think that that's something we have to be cognizant about. Um, and hopefully work with the community to help them understand that you know it is eighty thousand dollars to do this. So maybe there's somewhere we can meet in the middle. Um, well, it'd be nice, like you said, to get an idea of exactly how many folks that would really be sort of like um, a burden in that way. Um, we do have some awesome volunteer groups in town that help with snow. Yeah. Um, so if it's a manageable number, it could be something where we're just putting people in touch with groups like that too that could help break the bank. Uh, I'm going to put this in long-term high priorities because it's not something that um, I don't think we're going to do. We're not going to do in the next couple of weeks or months. Um, if it's something that we can start taking a look at, it's also something. Those services could also be um, grant funded. Um, talk to Living Word for Economic Development. I know this is something that has come up. It is a privately owned mall. Um, but they are a big portion of the mall, so I think maybe starting to, um, you know, trying to engage uh, Pastor Winston in some conversations just to see where he's at with that. Um, I know we've had some relationships with him in the past, but, uh, you know, I mean, it doesn't hurt to try the empty space that was utilized for the COVID vaccine um, places is still sitting empty, and so, you know, that is something that could be potentially bringing in sales tax revenue to the town. Um, the Madison Street location. And too. the Madison Street location they no longer utilize. So um, they still own the land, but they're not utilizing it. So is that a space that, you know, should be doing something else that could help bring revenue? So I'm going to put it in um, you know, long-term low priority, but then again, like not necessarily off the grid, which is something that we can, we can talk more about. Um, The lot um, I think this kind of goes with some things that Director Glinky and I have been talking about. Um, we have had a lot of conversations that involve spaces in town that we are trying to kind of parcel together and take a different take a different look at. You know, instead of just looking at one piece of land or one piece of property and saying, okay, you know, maybe we could do this with this. Um, we're trying to take a broader approach to um, you know, with Forest Park being landlocked, uh, you know, how can we how can we bring more development to Forest Park, right? and what does that development look like, whether it be retail or residential? Um, and so, you know, one of the things that has come up, and I remember talking about this several years ago as well, is there is a municipal lot at Circle and Roosevelt uh, due to parking. It's never full, and so is that a wasted resource that the village owns? Is that something? Is that piece of land? coupled with the area around it, um, which currently right now I know houses a garage for the Volvo dealership in Oak Park, um, is there something better that could go there? Uh, so I think that these conversations kind of long term, I, I feel like Director Glinky and I have, I guess, uh, unintentionally made them high priority, um, but as we kind of go through town to find areas that we can work on, um, we've been trying to identify parcels um, that we can, you know, hopefully get people interested in mm. and not just kind of piecemeal, you know, like, okay, there's one place here. Um, we're trying to really think outside of the box as to, you know, not being, not just looking at a building and saying, okay, this is what it was used for, but really kind of taking a look at the surrounding area around it and seeing if we can do something bigger with it. Uh, okay, and I'm going to bring the hot topic up of video gaming. Um, so... As requested at the last meeting, I did reach out to the Illinois Gaming Board to see, um, you know, just to kind of refresh everybody's memory. Um, video gaming was passed by the village several years ago, and then it was taken back through a referendum that was presented to the residents uh, during an election. So the idea came up again, um, as other towns around us had been bringing in quite a bit of revenue from video gaming. So I reached out to the Illinois Gaming Board to find out what mechanism was in place to reverse a binding referendum. They directed me to the state of Illinois. The state of Illinois has yet to get back to me. Um, and so um, I, 
I think one of the challenges with this is if you are somebody who is interested in bringing video gaming back is that uh, there is not currently a mechanism in place to reverse that. At least there's not one that is known. Um, and part of the reason is because video gaming is newer to um, the town and I think we're the only one, one of the few towns I should say, that reversed it through a referendum. So, um, you know, this was a revenue idea that came up, and I just kind of wanted to put it out on the table and see what the council's questions, feelings, you know, um, do we want to continue, do we want to put resources as a village into finding out how to bring it back? Um, floor's I'm, open. I'm going to start because I'm one of the ones who talked about it at the last meeting, and I'm what I was looking for is a quick answer to the question of um, can it be brought back? And my, I've talked to you about it and I've talked to someone from the anti-gaming group. Um, and what I've come to realize is that it's, there is no quick answer and it would be cost and time prohibitive and I don't want to see village dollars spent on it. But I do encourage any conversation. So, you know, I. I think it, it bothers me a little bit that it's kind of looked at as this dirty word, like this topic we're not allowed to discuss, you know, and it, it is a really, you know, profitable in other towns. Do I think we should spend village resources on investigating it? I do not. So I want to make that really clear, but I also am open to, you know, discussions about it. I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's um, too expensive and it would take too much time, so that's kind of where I stand on it. I mean, I think we have a discussion. Yes. There was there was a vote. You want community buy-in, having an opportunity for every single voter to have their voice heard and, and take a vote. I mean, to me, it's a it's a done issue. And you know, actual dollars, like on a lawyer, obviously not. There shouldn't be a penny of taxpayer money invested in finding out ways to undermine a democratic process and their vote. Um, I think the discussion even in this room is taking staff time. I, that's, this is not a topic for, for us to talk about. Um, I think the people voted, we were elected to represent the people, and we need to um, support uh, their decision and, and the laws as they're you know, written. Um, we've heard about some really great revenue ideas. Um, I think a million dollars on places for eating with um, you know, a, a um, commission sharing with the establishment, that sounds like a really um, positive thing that isn't that divisive, that we can move forward and uh, and start exploring these other opportunities. Commissioner Mellon Rogovins found $2 million worth of grants that we can apply for, and that's just foundational. Um, I think we shouldn't be stirring up this old discussion and, and a divisive topic um, when we have a lot of opportunities to invest our time and energy in. I agree we shouldn't spend money on it, but I do want to say, you know, as representing um, the residents, I have more people come to me with the question about gaming than any other single issue, and I feel I want to represent those people too, and when they ask me, you know, can the village do anything, I don't want to have to say, I don't know. I want to be able to have an answer to give them, and I don't want to feel afraid to talk about it, and I'm not afraid to talk about it. Um, like I just said, I don't want to spend village time, and yes, I agree that right now we're spending staff time and to some extent talking about it, but I'm, we should talk about it. We should talk about anything and everything. Everything should be on the table when we're trying to figure out how to make sure that we're in a strong financial position, and it needs to be on the table, and I don't want to be told we can't talk about this, or we shouldn't talk about this, you know, or, you know, you're compar people comparing me to Trump for wanting to talk about it. You know, I'm, I'm going to talk about anything and everything that people come to me and ask me about, and this is one of those topics. And it doesn't mean I'm going to spend a ton of time on it. It doesn't mean I'm going to advocate for the village to spend money on it, but I'm going to talk about it. Uh, when I... Uh, was campaigning uh, for this position and I was uh, collecting signatures from voters uh, to be considered 
to be on the ballot. Uh, I was, uh, this was probably the number one question that people asked me. Uh, did I uh, support video gambling? Would I bring video gambling back to, or video gaming back to the village? And uh, people made decisions based on my answer uh, as to whether or not they would sign my petition. And it was um, fine by me. Uh, you know, it's a democratic process as to how uh, people want to participate. And uh, I have uh, continued to say the same thing. Um, I, I think that uh, I believe in the will of the voters and I'm here to represent uh, the decision that was made by Forest Park voters uh, in the election where we made the decision about video gaming. Um, I'm not averse to conversation, uh, but uh, that is a decision that I respect and that I'll continue to respect uh, as long as I'm sitting in a representational uh, position here on the Village Council. So safe to say that what I'm hearing is that a majority of the council um, would not at this time support spending village dollars to look into the reinstatement of video gaming. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to open the floor to any questions, anything that anybody else here has to, wants to say. I have one more thing. I'd like to talk about um, Mr. Sullivan's second point when he talked about um, the number of non-sales tax generating businesses we have. And this is not a discussion that we need to have right now necessarily. Um, and I don't even know if other villages try to control like the composition of their DVD or if that's something that we want to do. It's not anything I've looked into before. So that's something I'd be interested in having a later discussion on. You're talking about like the composition as far as the number of sales tax businesses. Right, yeah, yeah. ones that are service generating businesses. sales tax versus services. You know, I don't know if that's something we can or should try to control, but I would like to learn more about that. I, I am aware of some uh, villages or some small towns that say that they want to make an effort to replace a retail business with another retail business if they can. Um, you know, that that's their it's first priority. Uh, and if they can, then, you know, <coughs> they give a first priority to right. replace with a retail business. Um, yeah. But then we have one, uh, one cannabis dispensary that's set to come online um, almost any day now. Yeah. Um, we have an inquiry about another location. Um, Perspective, uh, you know, the license holder wanted to consider whether the council uh, or the village would consider making uh, a second permitted use uh, location. Uh, I don't want to talk about the specific location now, but kind of just put it on the list um, to maybe have that discussion uh, internally with staff. Uh, it would save them uh, the cost of going through the building. I think they will be going forward. Yeah. And then also, I want to follow up to see that. about the other special mm -hmm. use you want to talk that about. we granted uh, a little over a year ago, whether, whether or not that's moving. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Um, you know what we don't have up there is Altenheim as a revenue. We have it on the ice. Do we? We have it on the expense side. We don't have um, it up there. It would also be a revenue to a, you know, long term, depending <coughs> on what goes in there and short term, we sell a portion of it. So I will put sale of all time. One, just along the same lines, one of the things that I think is contextual as we talk about expense and revenue in particular is, you know, the changing you know, business dynamic of not just, you know, just smaller towns. And I think, uh, you know, we've had a lot of businesses that have, have um, you know, uh, business owners retire, uh, the retail sector is changing, um, 
And so what types of businesses are moving into places like Forest Park? Um, you know, I know that um, I've helped some of our small businesses be aware of grants that are available that they can um, apply for, uh, with Connie and Privy. Um, and I think one of the things that doesn't quite fit within the discussion that we're having, but to that does go into business development is um, maybe in a short term, long, you know, short term low priority or short term, you know, in that medium priority is um, what resources do we have um, to help our business community as it exists. Um, tap into some of those resources for entrepreneur grants, um, ways to position Forest Park that's beyond the Chamber of Commerce that helps um, develop resources for the business community that we have to help heighten them and give them additional resources because, you know, we're still in, in that post-COVID era where we're changing um, you know, Connie has applied for two grants that I've helped her with. Is that something you're working with with the chamber to, you know, see so these are, this is not really in the uh, realm of the chamber. Yeah. It's not really, it's outside of the work with the chamber. Just maybe to communicate the chamber could be. I mean, I think that's great, because obviously the more successful our businesses are, the more successful we as a yeah. village are. I think maybe that's sure. something that the chamber could have a hand in with their, they have an economic, economic development committee. Um, yeah. I, I know that because I'm on it. So um, I think that's a great idea uh, when we're looking for ways to help with economic development. It's not all about bringing new right. businesses. I mean, that's a, that's a big portion of it, but how do we help the businesses that are in town currently right. um, become more successful? And have a I'm on the marketing <laughs> committee, yeah. so maybe it's something, something we can. Yeah, <laughs> something we can work together on. So. Okay, good. And there's a, a, a study from like 2015. It's like a business development um, packet that the village put out. I'm happy to share it with you. It's yeah, got some great ideas, but I don't know if anyone ever acted on them. But is it sort of like not again for today, but like partnering with the chamber? Um, you know, we can also motivate new businesses in different ways, like, you know, the village underwrites the first year membership to the chamber to try to boost their membership. And, you know, um, in that that uh, study from 2015, they mentioned um, having that resource for small businesses where you're um, helping them. Um, you have mentors with um, more well-established businesses mentoring the new folks and sort of that assistance helping them, like, apply for grants and things like that. that. The funding for Business incentive grants, I mean, or yes, we have business grants, yeah. No. We have to, um, of course, put together a. Um, we have to put together a. Okay. So, I mean, program, little yeah. bits, but then we can yeah. add to like that, like a larger economic program. If we base off of it, we have samples for um, TIF uh, grants, or TIF mm -hmm. programs that are available for, for businesses, so we can be all kind of similar to that. Great. Cool. Anything else? Um, All right, so I think this has been very productive. Um, we do have a regular council meeting schedule. We start in about 13 minutes. So, um, Cheryl has a motion to adjourn until the next full function. I'll make a motion. So move, second. Go second. Second. Go to move and second. Uh, Commissioner Maxim? Aye. Commissioner Bellinger-Golden? Aye. Commissioner Gold? Aye. Mayor Hassel? Aye. We are adjourned.